Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second public lecture as part of the demo program. We're letting people into the room, uh, so I'll just give a few seconds for the team to, to allow everyone to join, uh, and we'll start very soon. Welcome to our second public It's me. I was wondering if I was hearing my echo. Oh, <laughs> well, any uh, anything uh, that's happening on Zoom or something has to start with a little bit of a technical problem. So I mean, we are in this post-COVID era where everything starts with uh, unmute, mute, and, and yeah. stuff like. <laughs> we got too used to in-person uh, communication again, and so we we have to. We have to move yeah. back to hybrid now. All right. Sure. Yes. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ophélie Masson. I'm the Deputy Director of European Alternatives. And I'm very happy to welcome you to our second public lecture as part of the DEMO program. Uh, just a few words about European Alternatives. Uh, so we are an NGO uh, that was founded 16 years ago. Uh, we have an office in Paris, in Berlin, and in Palermo. And we have also actions across all EU member states in Europe and beyond Europe. So we're not limiting ourselves geographically, although I have to say most of our activities are currently taking place uh, in the EU. But we're trying to work on that and work on enlarging also our scope of, uh, of action. Uh, European Alternatives is uh, a pan-European organization. Uh, we defend the values of democracy across borders and across nations in a truly transnational perspective. Um, we are an anti-colonial, decolonial organization, and we defend such values. Uh, we also promote uh, civic and participatory democracy, uh, which means that we believe that uh, people should be more put at the center of our democracies. And that means going uh, using tools such as citizens' assemblies, popular assemblies, uh, ECIs, petitions, and the right for people to self-organize. Um, I am very happy to uh, let you know that this event is uh, part of our DEMO program, uh, which is about empowering and training activists. Uh, but I will let Victoria Kostova, the coordinator of the DEMO program, to now let you know a bit more about what it really means. Victoria? Thank you, Ophelie. Hello, everyone. Um, the, uh, I can see uh, a lot of um, uh, familiar uh, names uh, to me, so uh, just a big welcome to the new participants who managed to uh, come here this evening and to share it with uh, share it with us and our uh, amazing lecturers. So just very quickly, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the demo program. Um, so um, I should say that this was our this is our uh, second public lecture. The first one happened uh, in September, and uh, it. Uh, um, the speakers were uh, Yelena Vasilevich and Dobrik Veselinovic. Uh, so I hope that uh, this one will be as inspiring as the previous one, because I remember that you had a lot of questions back then. Um, the DEMO project gathered uh, six, uh, 60 activists from 21 European countries, uh, and the program aims to equip them with the required skills to, to empower their communities through a series of trainings, mentorship, and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So at the end of the program, um, the change makers will be encouraged to implement two activities uh, in their local context. Uh, and that is why during our first live bootcamp that is coming very soon, uh, between 3rd and 5th of, uh, of November in Sofia, uh, we will present a program that actually directly addresses this challenge. So we will gather uh, podcast producers, media influencers, storytellers, organizers, and communicators who will support the work of the participants. And um, um, also after this um uh, this bootcamp, we have a few more um, online events planned that will be open for the general audience as well. Uh, so I'm just going to state them very quickly. Uh, on the 30th, 30th of November, uh, we will have a public lecture with Ulrike Wonacek and um, Aaron Chaudhari. They will speak about the fundamental rights and environmental issues in foreign affairs. 
uh, and also about civic society support and activism and advocacy, which I think will be very interesting uh, for our audience. Uh, and then uh, to finish the year, uh, on 13th of uh, December, we will have a public lecture with Laura Sullivan from We Move, Move Europe and with uh, Arina Hodzore. And this lecture is going to be um, dedicated to the burnout prevention in activism, uh, which is something that we very often face as independent organizers and uh, as people working in the NGO sector. Uh, so I believe that this will be a very, a very positive and uh, uh, beautiful closure of the year. <laughs> so um, now I'm going to leave you uh, to, to our lecturers and to our amazing facilitator, Ofeli. Uh, and I really hope that uh, uh, what we prepared for you tonight will uh, really help you with your work, with your activism that you're actively practicing, and will bring a lot of, um, uh, of new skills and knowledge that we can after that discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. So as uh, you may know, of course, I mean, you all know, I'm sure, uh, we have uh, the next EP elections coming up in June 2024. Uh, so it is, of course, a crucial moment in our democracies, uh, in the EU, but also around, of course, because this has obviously an impact also in the rest of European countries. Uh, and I think this is why it's very important moment to have a discussion with our two speakers uh, today, with Radomir Lazovic and with uh, Shaista Aziz, who will join us uh, very soon, um, because you both have this common pattern of the fact that you are both grassroots activists. You started on the streets, if I may say, uh, and then you decided to transform that activism into direct political action by becoming elected uh, politicians, which is, of course, very interesting for uh, our audience, uh, I'm sure. So uh, without further ado, I want to give you the floor, uh, Radomir, uh, to explain us a bit about how you have experienced that transformation yourself uh, I will briefly introduce you, of course. So you are currently the head of the parliamentary group of the Greens. Uh, I will let you pronounce the name of the group uh, in the Serbian parliament. Uh, you were born in 1980 in Belgrade and you've been active in the civil sector for more than 12 years. Uh, you worked at the Institute for Urban Policies before uh, in the field of cultural policies. Uh, you have done uh, participation of citizens in making decisions about the development of the city, so direct civilian action, uh, civil, political, and social rights also, democratic innovations, and the media. You have participated in the launch of several initiatives, uh, of which I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll talk about uh, very, very soon. And you have advocated for innovative use of public spaces, uh, for fair man management of public resources, uh, the transformation of those public services and uh, establishing solidarity and democratic society in those uh, spaces. And from 2015 to 2017, you were the president of the board of directors of uh, the Association of the Independent Cultural Scene of uh, Serbia. Uh, uh, so, Radomir, I'm very happy to have you uh, with us. And I give you the floor to explain us a bit about your path uh, your personal path as an activist and uh, how you transform this into uh, into being directly involved into into politics in Serbia. Thank you, Ophelia, and thank you, Victoria, for this <clears throat> introduction. And thank you guys for coming to and showing up to, to listen to us and uh, the opportunity for me to uh, to remember the, the beginnings of my, uh, well, activist or political work or, or political life. Well, now looking back on, on what happened uh, uh, and what brought me to the position that I am in now, I wouldn't say that I had a clear idea that I would ever be participating as an elected uh, member of the Serbian parliament or, or any other parliament. Uh, I guess as many of you, I started with uh, my ideas in a way that I thought it is the best <laughs> going to, <clears throat> sorry, going from activism, from ideas or for me it was the ideas of how to use uh, public or other spaces uh, mainly for the cultural production uh, and in this moment uh, I, we started uh, me and my colleagues uh, we started uh, before uh, i would say 2011 or something like even maybe 10 so it's been about 13 years when we started to work on different kind of um, ideas and projects but uh, uh, I, as I told you, I, I was not expecting to to end up in the in the parliament or or, or to be a, a head of the parliamentary group. 
In this moment, we have the parliamentary session in, in Belgrade, and it's been uh, one of the, well, mostly uh, obstructed or one of the more terrible ones when we have 60 uh, points of the agenda brought into one and a lot of uh, really bad laws being pushed overnight and uh, we have a sort of a, a democratic crisis when we are talking about, about parliament. Why am I telling you this? It is because uh, uh, I was not expecting when I got get into the parliament, when I, when I start to work in, in, in parliament, I was not expecting such a bad situation. Uh, still us coming from outside, not from direct politics and so on, we have this idea that these people with the suits and, and, and ties and the very expensive suits, I would say, they have any idea of how things are working out, but in the end we see that it is not so often and actually that uh, all this, uh, what they are doing is is uh, being uh, having direct impact on life of people. And I wanted to participate into that and try to stop this and to or to create a different kind of of politics. But uh, let's go back a little bit. As I as I mentioned, I started uh, my uh, public life. Let's say it like this because I would I would always say that the activism and politics are uh, intertwined, in, 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 or especially it was for me and my colleagues. Uh, so we started from. Uh, something that we uh, wanted to do in the uh, in the streets of Belgrade, uh, we tried to create a street gallery out of the out of the uh, depilated uh, rundown street in the city center. You know those kind of streets that you wouldn't uh, pass through if you are coming uh, if you are passing through the through the city center. That, that the one that would be behind something where there would be garbage or. Um, some strollers would uh, use it as a as a toilet or something like that. Well, that kind of a street in the city center, we managed to occupy it or or liberate it, however you want to to uh, look at uh, at what we did, and we uh, renovated it, reconstructed it, and we started using it as an open air gallery. And um, it you uh, it was actually this street is uh, behind the cinema. So it already had the frames in which you should put the posters for the for the next movies and so on, but it was completely destroyed. And that that gave us the idea: maybe we can do something out of that. Maybe not for the cinema posters, but for the art uh, of the artists. And uh, I will try to to show you uh, just to show you a little bit how it looks because I think that uh, it it. it um, if you can and so this is how it looked uh, uh, oh sorry uh can i uh, yeah great so this is uh how it looked like this i don't know if you see everything but maybe we cannot we can't we don't go into yes we see well yeah yeah okay so this is uh how it looked in the beginning so you see it's completely this destroyed, I would say, but this used to have these uh, pictures for posters. And then we renovated it, and now it is a place where people get together and enjoy art or have a nice evening uh, as an openings and so on. But also during the day, you can just pass through and see what is new in the gallery and what's happening there. And um, why is this important? This gallery has been done, this is the first such project that's been done in, in a civil uh, public partnership where the city of Belgrade gave us to use this this space. But this is something that we did completely by the book. We have a contract, we started to do it, and we, we just to use these walls, we had to uh, prepare this for two years. It took us two years to create this. And in the same moment when we, as a group, as Ministry of Space and, uh, and my group of people, that we, it's, it's a colloquial name for the for our organization, like Ministry of Space, like a joke name for us being ministers of, of some idea that space should be free. Uh, we started this other idea in, with a lot of people that is to uh, also occupy and uh, renovate the building that has been standing and, and uh, being destroyed for a long time in uh, outside of the city center. Because we always felt that the culture and, and, and these cultural centers or any other kind of venues, 
you have them in the city center, but when you go a little bit out of the uh, of what is usually places for culture, you don't have anything in Belgrade. But maybe in your cities where do you come from, maybe the culture is more more decentralized. But in my city and, and also country, everything is completely central. So we wanted to do this in the uh, a little bit outside of the of the city center. And um, I always use these two examples because this was not so. I mean, this was more of a silent occupation of something that wasn't him, sort of a squat, and uh, we used it to pro to create uh, culture, to make uh, festivals or or concerts or uh, different kind of exhibitions and so on. It also had residents that would use some of the spaces for in a, in in a more of a permanent uh, time. We organized different kind of actions to fix the place, and it was a sort of a, a joint uh, action to to do something out of this space. And in the end, after four or five years, people that use this space were evicted, as squads tend to be evicted and uh, destroyed. In the end, uh, we had our time there, and uh, I think that uh, this time. Uh, the, the time that this squad was uh, operating, it, it created opportunities for many people to 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 produce their art. But uh, why I use this example is because we just started working there without any preparation. We just got in and started working uh, what we wanted to do. It was not so... Uh, you, you didn't have all the conditions you needed, but still you had people, you had goodwill, you had connections, networks that pe that people wanted to create something out of that, and it actually created something good. Uh, so two years uh, to do it legally, just uh, immediately to start working on something that was not uh, uh, legally done by contract and so on, but still we managed to create a, a working cultural center. Uh, I worked also in with other people, so I was uh, one of the people that, that started these ideas about several other uh, or occupations or liberations of the of the places. Also, one of them connected with the cinemas is uh, Cinema Zvezda in the city center of Belgrade that we uh, occupied with uh, different kind of people that mostly um, working with, uh, that come from the film production. And then uh, they continued uh, staying there and uh, for years they are playing movies and so on. And it, it's uh, one of the places that was uh, liberated from 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 being destroyed. Uh, why am I saying this? Because the, uh, as you can see, I'm, uh, everything I did was sort of connected with the with the space, with uh, usage of space, with fair usage of space. And uh, we tried whenever we working on this uh, on these cultural centers, we were trying to create some models in which people that uh, generally don't have um, where to create something or to produce or to exhibit or, or, or perform, they should be the one that these kind of places should be uh, built for. And we tried to, through these uh, uh, cultural centers or gallery or whatever we, that we did, we tried to open new possibilities to the, to the people because we always, I mean, believe that culture is creating also a new kind of criticism of uh, society. It creates, especially in engaged uh, art and, and uh, culture, it creates a sort of a different view on the, uh, on the environment around you. And I feel it is also politically important that you have a vibrant cultural scene because uh, this is something where the new ideas are coming from and it's something that should be cherished and and and, and uh, uh, I mean, every I mean the society is good as much as uh, as it has culture so that's something that we always believed in uh, creating these spaces got us into this situation that uh, uh, we were trying to use the spaces but we couldn't and it got us working with the municipalities or different levels of government and so on and and uh, we uh, were also working uh, on how uh, how cities should be developed and so on and in that moment we uh, in belgrade there was this uh, i would say terrible uh, projects that uh, started uh, to uh, just a second that started to uh, tried to 
developed waterfront in Belgrade. This is an old presentation that I'm showing, but uh, it started, this is, this is the, the Bank of Belgrade in 2015. And this is what they wanted to create. And they are creating something like that in Belgrade now. And why am I showing this? Because in moments that we were working with these cultural centers, galleries, and so on, these people showed up and tried to take away a huge part of Belgrade and create this sort of Dubai style, 1.8 million square meters, millions of uh, residential units, hotel rooms, and, and stuff like that. And uh, this is something that got me going into the politics. This is something that was formative to the uh, group that you, you, you mentioned, the, the, the Greens, Green Left uh, Front in, in Serbia. We, we used to call ourselves before Medaillon Beograd, Don't Let Belgrade Drown is a translation. And this is what really got us uh, thinking about how the city should be developed. Should it be for the for the investors or should it be more for people that are actually needing the space to develop a, a different kind of ideas, programs, uh, public goods, uh, natural goods, parks, and, and so on. And we started by uh, uh, opposing these, uh, this uh, project. Uh, uh, it's, it's called Belgrade on Water, Belgrade Waterfront. And uh, for years, we had this sort of uh, uh, comical actions uh, blowing this uh, this is the, the the session in the in the city parliament and we uh, stopped it by blowing up the beach equipment because it's a uh, belgrade on water is the name so we came ready for the beach and so on and we were all, always joking a little bit with the with the huge problems that were there we knew it was huge but we still wanted to show it in a different way so to include people to create more uh, uh, possibilities to people to get involved in such serious uh, problems such as uh, urban development or or, or uh, uh, development of, of the of the cities. We created a lot of uh, attraction here and uh, getting together people that are uh, experts and professors and uh, also activists and just citizens and creating sort of a network of uh, defense of Belgrade. Well, this is uh, us uh, showing up in different spaces, but going a little bit faster because we don't have time for me to to tell you all the all the stories in in the last years but uh, we ran for the city elections uh, sort of on the wave of this um, idea to stop this kind of uh, the city development i will explain the duck there's the, there's the duck uh, and we ran for the elections in that 2018 and we were serious, serious seriously uh sort of the a lot of people came to the protests and so on, but we couldn't manage to get into the city park. Uh, this, what you see, is a sort of a mascot of the of the movement. It's the yellow duck, the huge yellow duck that we uh, tried uh, to get attention with because we were always playing with this Belgrade on water. So uh, there's this beach equipment, there's the cute duck and, and so on, and people would gather around the duck and protest against the, against the unwanted uh, uh, waterfront development uh several years later you see us blocking the, 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 the construction machines creating different kind of protests we all uh, also did this with the this is one of my favorite actions in which we uh got the duck on top of the boat and uh, and opposed the police and the city and the mayor of belgrade at that time and uh, we created a lot of uh, uh, sort of attention that we needed so people can understand that this development is bad. But unfortunately, we lost the battle. Uh, Belgrade is now, this kind, this part of Belgrade is being uh, uh, developed into this seriously uh, horrible uh, project. It is going, which is, it's not the, the it, of course, it's not the idea if it's uh, uh, pretty or, it, or not, but the idea is it will have a huge impact on the, on the life of the city and also of the country because it's actually a money laundering scheme. A few years later, we ran for the elections in uh, in uh, Parliament of Belgrade and uh, Serbia. Actually, a few years la last year, and uh, we won uh, uh, we won the seats. Uh, but also our coalition group uh, that was uh, uh, a different uh, political movements that are close to us got together, together also with us and then we 
uh, managed to be the strongest opposition uh, group in the city parliament, and we are also participating in the, into the national parliament. And I would like maybe to stop now because I have many of these stories and wouldn't like to uh, bother you if, if maybe you know, maybe you have any questions or something where to start from here or you want something to be clarified and so on. Thank you very, very much, Radomir. Uh, indeed, we, we're getting familiar now with the DEDACs, thanks to, to um, the whole group. Um, and I, I think uh, it would be also very interesting to to hear, but maybe we can get into that uh, right after, but maybe if you want to say a few words now actually about your personal experience as an activist, how you've experienced, experienced sorry, uh, the, the transformation from being a grassroots activist occupying places in the city and then finding yourself spending your days uh, in a in a council city council room, um, how how did you operate the change, and how how did you do? You still define yourself as an activist, actually, maybe, or do you define yourself more as a politician? If there's any difference, well, I'm uh, maybe my uh, also my group. Uh, we are not really uh, uh, wouldn't consider ourselves so uh, politicians in in that in that way that we are. Uh, I don't know coming from the faculty of, of politicology or something, you know, we are activists that were involved. But my transformation is, uh, well, I to tell you the truth, uh, I don't know. I wasn't expecting uh, to get into the politics, but still uh, we we needed to. It was so obvious that there is no political party that was uh, uh, defending our own ideas or, or at least anything that is close to us. There was this uh, traditional parties that were... Uh, so corrupt and uh, completely betrayed any idea of public interest and so and uh, uh, if it wasn't for so many of our activists would just go to the parties that were already there so we started like we started our own organization but it was really hard to do, to do it because every, everybody is against you when you when you start to get into the political life yeah uh, in the personal sphere it is a bit um, it is a bit hard because it takes away your private life. It takes away everything that you you, you don't know. You don't even know that you uh, you have, and it's so important. And, and in the streets, when people are asking you about different stuff about uh, city development or, or the or, or the state of the uh, of Serbia or, or wherever you are from, and then you you end up thinking of oh my God, why why did I get into this? But this feeling. Especially this feeling when you get in front of the huge group of people and they are listening what you have to to tell them and this is coming from also not from not from you also but from my whole organization because we are really uh, I would say uh, inclusive and and uh, and uh, organization that takes takes the opinion of the, its uh, members really seriously. It is something that drives you forward and it gets you to to you know give a little more every day. Um, I would say that uh, I didn't make a mistake getting into the politics. I, I feel that there is a lot of things that I can do to better things in Serbia. Also, uh, speaking with European alternatives and knowing your transnational uh, um, character, I would say that we also have a nice cooperation with people in the region and also in uh, left or green organizations or progressive around Europe. And it's also important to say that these many of the problems that we are facing, also I know in Bulgaria or in Croatia or in Romania, there are problems that we have in all of our societies. And then you can go from pollution of air, or, or which comes from I don't know uh, usage of coal, or, or or you can go also to these identity questions, or you can go to the uh, always uh, uh, present question about economic inequalities. It is all something that we need also this transnational uh, 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 response to. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, maybe just one one last question uh, before also I, I open the, the questions. If uh, you have some also as the participants, uh, you're more than welcome to, to ask your questions. You can post them, you can write them in the Q&A section. I see someone already started. Uh, so feel free to ask all the questions you want to Radomir uh, in writing, and then Please we'll read the questions uh, out loud. And we might also have some questions coming from social media that Victoria will 
tell us about if we if we have some. Uh, but yeah, just another another question on that is, I mean, obviously this was a collective decision from moving from being a a street movement and a really a civil movement into a political party. Do you think that something was perhaps lost or transformed when you went from being a civil movement to being a political party? And if so, what what would that be? Uh, I just remember this uh, this meeting, uh, the one of the first meetings, because we were sort of a little bit of a group of people that are uh, sitting around in, in circle and discussing everything for hours and so on. And we were speaking, uh, shall we go into the politics or not? And uh, we were a bit afraid because we didn't want to break the group. Of course, there are people that don't want to go into politics, and I really respect that. But in the end, only one person said that uh, she thinks that she um, it's okay if we go into politics, but she will not participate. And then she ended up being on the list of the elections because she wanted to support the thing. Well, of course, there's a lot of thing changes because you, uh, when you are activist, you want to be a, a corrective factor. You want someone to, you want the people that are in government to take your opinion or to take your strong stance or to take your analysis and of monitoring of different kinds of things in the society and do something about it. You want to make them influence or you want to create these networks or, or forums or, or whatever. But when you get into the politics, you want to be the one that is making those decisions. And for us coming from the civil society or the activism and so on, we feel that there is this possibility that it, it doesn't have to be so strict that you are a politician or you are an activist. Yes, we come from this uh, uh, different, uh, well not come, but it is a little bit different, but still we try to say for ourselves that we are with one, one, one leg in the streets and the other one in the institutions, as many of the progressive uh, movements do and then say, because we try to, to uh, sort of uh, get this idea that so many great people activists have and, and they were really uh, working on them and got people to supporting them. And then in the end, it, nothing happens or at least maybe not nothing, maybe a big things happen, but not enough happens to change the society. So forgive me if I ha sound a little bit idealistic, if I sound a little bit uh, naive, if I say that that's all that we want to get into the mainstream life of the of not to be uh, some sort of the uh, periphery of the society that there are some nice ideas and then uh, it all stays in that level of the nice ideas no we want to make them part of the uh, everyday uh, political life in, in serbia also in europe also in different other other places because uh, that that we saw in the in the streets that these people that these things are really important to people and that is something that I want to do, working with uh, getting into the politics. And hi, Shaysta. <laughs> Thank you, Radomir. Uh, it, it, like, this is a, a small price to pay, maybe. Um, Yes, well, thank you very much uh, for, for your first intervention. I will give the introduce and give the floor to, to Shaista Zidna, who, who has joined us, and then we can go into the more uh, Q&A moment. So in the meantime, uh, for the participants, if you have questions uh, and reactions to what uh, Radomir uh, shared about his experience in Belgrade, uh, please feel free to, to write those questions in the Q&A, and we'll come back to, to your questions uh, very soon. Um, but Shaista, very, very happy to have you here. Uh, welcome to this uh, second public lecture of the demo program. Uh, so I will briefly introduce you. Uh, Shaista, you are an award-winning national uh, anti-racism and equalities campaigner. Uh, you're also a journalist, a writer, and the co-director of an organization called The Three Hijabis. Uh, you're, of course, uh, highly skilled and experienced uh, in communications uh, and media. This is your specialty. Uh, you also work specifically in uh, crisis communication and complex emergencies. Uh, you're a high profile campaigner, uh, which you've applied both in your work and your activism, a uh, skilled political analyst, and you've carried out uh, your work through the lens of uh, intersectionality always. Um, so your broadcast, journal broadcast journalism and writing has appeared in international media, uh, very famous titles like the New York Times, the Washington Post, Al Jazeera, uh, CNN, uh, and the BBC. Uh, you're also a facilitator, a media trainer, and a regular public speaker, which is what you're doing now with us. 
uh, and also uh, you you are trained in a trans transactional analysis. Apologies. Uh, so I'm very happy to have you. I know you're very busy these days uh, with many political changes, of course, which I'm sure you'll talk to us about. Uh, but please, uh, the floor is yours uh, so that you can introduce a bit about your path uh, as an activist and also how did you go from being a street grassroots activist into being a politician and how is that playing uh, around? Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to apologize to everyone for being late. It wasn't my intention to be late. Uh, I had to go into an emergency meeting. So please forgive me. And Radhami, I'm very sorry I wasn't able to hear your contribution, um, but hopefully we can catch up separately as well. And also just to thank Ophelia and Victoria for organizing this and everybody involved. And also to specifically apologize to both of you who were trying to find out where I was a few minutes ago. So sorry about that. Um, so it's really great to be here with you uh, this evening. Um, I really believe in solidarity and I believe in international solidarity. And I think we need this more than ever given the state of the world and specifically Europe as well. Um, so thank you, Ophelia, for your very kind introduction. Um, what I'm going to do with my allocated time and please stop me if I'm going over time is just to sort of give a bit of an overview of my, uh, I'm just putting my um, stopwatch on, um, to give a bit of an overview of my journey so far into activism and politics, which to me align very closely. So um, I'm from Oxford, born and raised in Oxford, which is where I'm talking to you from this evening. My family are from Pakistan. Um, my late dad arrived here in the UK in the 50s, like a lot of working class British Pakistanis. There was a call out from the British government to uh, ask for working class labourers to come to this country, to the UK, to help rebuild it post-war. So my late dad came here at the age of 16, which obviously is very young, he was a child, uh, but he was very inquisitive about the world. Um, a lot of my influence in politics comes from him. Uh, he was a trade unionist, a lifelong trade unionist in the UK. Um, in the UK, it's very fashionable for uh, the children of immigrants, I'm the proud daughter of immigrants, to be uh, the offspring of transport workers you know uh, the London Mayor Sadiq Khan frequently talks about the fact that his dad was a bus driver various other politicians do that as well so I'm the proud daughter of a rail worker and my dad was a member of the um, National uh, Rail Union for 35 plus years and he actually took early retirement when the railway system was privatized by the British state um, now, growing up as a child, um, politics was very much part of our household. So lo local politics, national UK politics, the politics of Pakistan, which all of us know are very complicated, very dramatic, um, but also global politics. So I grew up with a really, um, I grew up in a household where we were encouraged to talk about things. Uh, we were encouraged to be curious about what was happening in the world and to have those conversations. And I also grew up in a household where there was a backdrop of um my late dad in particular, but my mum and my uncle and various other relatives um, being subjected to very violent physical and verbal racism. Uh, this was a time when fascists were openly marching on the streets in the UK. Um, and I'm one of my earliest memories, and people are always shocked when I talk about this. Um, but one of my earliest memories was um, when I was a child living in Oxford. I think I was either seven or eight. And the National Front, as they were then called, which is an organised fascist organisation, were marching across lots of different UK cities. And they came to Oxford and they uh, put a message out to say that if they saw any people of colour, I'm using polite language, they didn't use polite language, if they saw any of us looking uh, through our windows or coming out of our homes, that we would be at, we would be at risk of their violence. So I vividly remember that I was not allowed to go to school for one particular day and all my cousins were not allowed to go to school and they all came to our home um, and my uncle and auntie went to work and my cousin stayed with us and we had the curtains drawn all day long and I was seven or eight years old and I was very terrified that potentially a house could be um, burnt down because those are the kind of threats that were being issued. Um, now, when you're a child, you don't necessarily fully understand all of this. But what you do understand is that your parents are not able to protect you and the adults are not able to protect you. And this is a really devastating and horrifying feeling for a child. And right now, as I speak to you, there are children around the world, Ukraine, Sudan, 
uh, Palestine, Gaza in particular, and indeed their children in Israel who are feeling the same way as well. And this is something that I really center in terms of grounding grounding me in myself um, and the power that I have um, in my activism and, and the political space I'm in to uh, always remember this, remember what I'm, who I'm trying to um, represent and who I'm trying to stand in solidarity with. So this was a very early um, kind of grounding for me. Um, and then, you know, I was actively involved at school in writing about lots of things going on in the world. Um, I was very lucky that I went to a really good state schools um, in Oxford, where my teachers were sometimes a little bit bemused by me because there weren't actually any other uh, girls, Muslim girls like me, or indeed white girls or any girls who were really talking about politics in the way that I was. But I was very lucky that they nurtured me and they encourage me um, to carry on with, with being that inquisitive. And again, this is something that I really has shaped me and I feel very, very lucky about. So if we fast forward a bit, um, I always knew I wanted to be a journalist. Um, I was, I'm the first woman in my family to go to university, which I'm very proud of. Um, my parents are, well, I no longer have my dad with us. He passed away six years ago. Um, but my parents came to this country as working class migrants. They would now be classified as economic migrants. And they grafted very hard. Um, and, you know, like I said, I was the first person to go to university. I was very curious about stories. And I was very keen to become a journalist. Now, I'm sure many of you know that in the UK, uh, we have a very extreme class system which uh, British people don't really like to talk about. It is um, a fundamental part of this country's structures. And most journalists come from very white elite backgrounds. They come from, uh, the, they are basically the top percentage of, of the population. They've overwhelmingly gone to private schools. They've overwhelmingly gone to Oxbridge and they overwhelmingly don't look or sound like me or come from the background I'm from. So I knew this was a tall order, but I was very determined because I'm, I'm a determined individual. So um, I did end up getting into journalism. I had to go through different routes to get there, um, but I ended up working at the BBC years as a broadcast journalist and a producer um, I really loved my time working at the BBC the BBC is consistently under assault by the governments of the day and sadly in the UK most of those governments have been conservative governments and currently we have a very extreme right-wing conservative government so they're constantly attacking public broadcasters um, the Brexit situation has really polarised the entire country. It's also polarised a lot of our media as well. So I got into journalism um, and I was in the newsrooms when Afghanistan was uh, invaded by the Americans and the allies, including Britain. And then I was there for the, well, actually, no, I left before the start of the Iraq war because I did not want to be in, those, in that newsroom again. Um, at the time, I was internalising a lot of conscious and unconscious Islamophobia, a lot of bigotry. Um, like I said, I'm, I understand maybe my colleagues didn't even understand at the time what was going on in the newsroom. Things have shifted, not completely in the way that we want it to. But yeah, so um, I left. I went to do a master's in refugee studies and I ended up working in the aid sector. So I went from uh, this very homogenized environment of um, mainstream broadcast media in the UK to going to a very homogenized um, aid system that obviously has, they intersect in many ways because again, a lot of people over on this side who, who work in aid are very privileged people coming from very privileged backgrounds. Um, so consistently, I think one of the themes here is that I found myself in overwhelmingly in spaces where there's a lot of power, where someone like me is not really present uh, in in large large numbers of people who look like me. I'm not necessarily talking about my faith here as a Muslim woman, even though that is very very significant. I'm talking about being a working class person and who is not from the upper echelons of the class system of this country. Um, so this has been a, a running theme in my life and in my career. Um, so I went to work in the aid sector. I spent more than 15 years working in international aid. Um, I found it very challenging in a different way to journalism and news. Um, my role overwhelmingly in aid uh, was to work in story gathering and um, in communications at senior level, um, also uh, working to sensitize local populations and all actors and conflicts as to why the, the, aid, the aid organization was there. 
So my last role was with Doctors Without Borders, Medicine Sans Frontier. I was working in northeast Nigeria, in Borno State, uh, with the victims uh, of Boko Haram, uh, overwhelmingly women and girls, very young girls, sadly, as well, uh, were in need of health care, including uh, those girls who'd been raped um, and were giving birth. Um, so I have a lot of experience of working internationally and working around the world and seeing up close and personal the disastrous, really disastrous, catastrophic, I'd say, foreign policy in Western countries and Eastern countries and indeed Arab world as well. And the implication of these, these failed politics on populations of people. And overwhelmingly, I've been working with people who are displaced, uh, displaced internally and displaced externally as well. So refugees as well. So I'm going to move forward now a little bit to politics. So um, six years ago, I decided to come back to the UK and stand as a Labour councillor in my home city of Oxford. So at the time, my dad, who, was, as I said, was a great influence on my life and continues to be, was diagnosed with lung cancer. So I wanted to come back home and spend time with my father. Um, I'm, I'm very blessed. I'm someone who's travelled the entire world. I have seen and met people and met people and seen things that most people would never dream of in a good way and a, and, a, and, a, and a negative way as well. So I wanted to come home and be available for my parents. Um, so I was very lucky that I was able to attend all my dad's chemo sessions in the hospital. And every time I'd come back home to visit my family in Oxford, I was really shocked and stunned to see levels of deprivation increasing. This is at the height of the Tory the government's austerity measures. And in particular, I was shocked to see the number of homeless people, people who are homeless, sleeping in the doorways of our world famous university and the colleges. And I couldn't understand what was going on, because remember, I'm I'm out there doing this international aid work, going to very insecure environments and seeing that side of the story. And I'm coming back to the UK and seeing a different side of the story. So um, uh, I decided to stand as a Labour councillor. And my ward is about three and a half miles, forgive me, I'm not sure what it is, in kilometres uh, from the centre of Oxford. So I've been a Labour councillor for six years. Um, in that time, I've been very proud to represent the people of the city I was born and raised in, the city where my family live, where my nieces and nephews go to school, where my mum accesses a hospital, all those things. This city... Um, is it means something very it's something very personal to me this is my home city um so as of two weeks ago i resigned as being a labor councillor i'll get to that in a minute but while i've been a labor councillor i have been on the cabinet for four years so i've been a cap i've been on the cabinet for four years and i've been a councillor for six years and my time on the cabinet has been um a cabinet member for inclusive communities cabinet member for inclusive communities and culture and cabinet member for safer communities so my work really involves uh, having direct contact with the very diverse number of people in our city um i believe close to 30 plus percent of people in my city here are people born outside of the uk including eu residents we have a very diverse city so i've been involved in lots of different initiatives around um countering domestic abuse for example um lots of work around anti-racism um i helped set up the council's anti-racism charter i sat on the oral college university of oxford commission of inquiry into the cecil road statue um this was at a time when the colston statue was thrown into the river in on the back of the Black Lives Matter movement. So I've been involved in a lot of these discussions and bridge building between the university um, and where the wealth of the city is, which we call the gown, and where real people live, which is called the town. So I've been involved in lots of work um, around this, and I've been involved, proudly involved, in working with lots of different stakeholders, students, working class people, trade unionists, a whole group of people. And for me, this is how I work. I believe that we have to... Um, open up space for people to be seen and heard. And my role is to do that. And my role is also to be standing with people, not, not talking for them, not talking over them, but being with them and working out how to connect them with policymakers in the city and people in power, elected officials in power, to get them to listen and to make change. And I'm very proud of the fact that lots of changes have occurred, particularly around homelessness in the time that I've been a councillor, which I've really pushed for, which I'm really proud of. Um, 
So I've only got a few minutes left, so I'm just going to skip to the last two weeks. So as we know, there's a devastating uh, new uh, cycle of horror going on in the Gaza Strip in Palestine. And also there's been terrorist atrocities carried out in Israel by Hamas. Um, when this was all starting up again, I was at Labour Party conference in Liverpool and I was devastated and heartbroken as any decent minded person should be and still still is. So um, I was really shocked and horrified to hear the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, going on national radio and pretty much saying, he says he didn't say this, however, we all heard him. He was asked a question about whether Israel had the right to cut off electricity, water, gas, food to the besieged population of the Gaza Strip. And he said, yes, Israel has that right. Then he went on a bit more and said that he encouraged the Israeli state to act in in accordance with international law. So what's happened since he made this statement is there's been extreme upset and hurt and horror across lots of different communities. Um, But obviously, it's deeply impacted British Muslims, British Jewish people. But I I will say this all day long. The issue of Israel and Palestine is not about Muslims or Jewish people or Christian people or religion. It is about human rights and humanity and uh, international law and um, humanitarian law. And disproportionately, the devastation in Israel and Palestine impacts global Jewish communities and people and global Muslim people and, and, and communities. So um, I waited to find out, uh, I wrote to the local representatives of our Labour Party here in Oxford, uh, at local council level and at national um, level, along with another colleague. And uh, we waited to get a response. We didn't hear back from them for 48 hours. We asked again if they could let us know if this was the official Labour front bench line punishment of the people of Gaza, which is what withholding water, gas, electricity and food is. So we never heard back from them. Uh, my colleague wrote back and said, my situ- my position here as a councillor is untenable, so I need to hear back from you. We then received an email, which is a copy and paste email. Essentially, it, w- it was all about Hamas. We were very shocked about this. We elected Labour councillors asking the leadership if they can clarify the position and all we're hearing about is Hamas, who we condemn unequivocally. unequivocally. So we resigned. Um, so that was two weeks ago. In that time, um, eight la- uh, eight Labour councillors have resigned in total from Oxford. Oxford City Council was a majority Labour-run council. It now is no longer a majority Labour-run council. There are 24 councillors now who are Labour and 24 opposition council. Um, members, including now myself and my colleague, who are, in, who, who are now standing as independents. Um, it's been a really devastating time. My devastation is nothing compared to the people of Israel and Palestine. Uh, I'm not trying to suggest it is. Um, I feel exhausted um, and horrified by everything that's going on, including the inability of a future uh, British Prime Minister, who is very likely, Keir Starmer is likely to become the next Prime Minister, to stand up for international law and what is right. Um, I will wrap up here just by saying there has been no call for a ceasefire by the British government or by the British opposition. This is unacceptable. And in the meantime, um, lot uh, cancelled their membership of the Labour Party. And in earlier this afternoon, The Guardian published an article of mine which was focusing on the impact on British Muslim communities who feel the working class people, uh, uh, you know, who belong to these communities overwhelmingly feel very disrespected by what's gone on. But as I said, this is not a Jewish Muslim issue. This is a human rights issue. And, you know, that. and politics will go hand in hand. And, you know, I think to be, and in a way that is truthful and that is rooted in our principles um, and rooted in the communities that we're from, which is what I've done. So I run uh, as an independent counselor and I uh, believe in dialogue. I believe in nuance. So I'm looking to work with the Labour Party in Oxford and the Green Party and the Liberal Democrats and the independents to collectively make good um, decisions 
for the people of our city in terms of how their services are being run in the city. So I will stop there. I could talk a bit more, but I think I've spoken for more than enough and I will wait for the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you very much, Shaista. And don't worry, we I think we could listen to you for hours. Uh, and, you know, it's very interesting to hear also about your own experience. Of course, people can ask questions now and uh, so you can you can respond to them. Uh, but thank you very much for sharing also your personal, very personal experience of what it means for you to be an activist and why you decided to then commit yourself in politics, but also to put a limit to it uh, when you felt that your personal boundaries were not being respected and your personal values were not being uh, respected. Um, so thank you so much. I propose that we, we go directly then into the questions because uh, people are already starting writing them. Um, so we have a uh, first question uh, from Moncho, uh, who says, uh, this year in local and regional politics in Spain, I had a similar feeling that those who reach the top in their parties don't have much knowledge about what they do uh, and openly say that they don't need to know what they do, uh, that they just have to, uh, that they just have the order of democracy to tell others what to do, that they have the mandate, I guess, of being the representatives of democracy, which uh, would should in their in their head uh, be enough uh, to to legitimize uh, their mandate uh, crazy but how can we change this in our societies and i know Radumir, you started uh, already uh, responding a little bit so maybe you want to go and uh, give a response uh, to to that and uh, shy style of course then uh, also afterwards i think Radumir, you're muted yeah yeah i had to do it once uh, I, well, uh, I think that uh, it is a question about the values of your organization. Is it uh, driven by the power and uh, and also financial benefits of being a politician or someone in power, or is it uh, are there any mechanisms that are actually uh, developed to prevent these kind of uh, situations in which the the party uh, leadership is completely out of the out of the uh, planet for the for the people that are actually members and it really feels like that in these uh, traditional parties we because we because we started uh, created something new then we have the opportunity not to get into this trap and i'm not saying that we will not i have no clue i'm but we are trying not to so we are uh, spending um, spending time and effort to create mechanisms in which this wouldn't happen and there is not i think that there is no better answer except to acknowledge that this is a trap and there should be something concrete that is done not to get into the, this kind of trap and we try to as i said in my short answer we try to connect with the cso's that are not even part of the party but we try to get them involved into this broader discussions in which we can see what we what did we do wrong as a as a as a leadership sort of with activists that are uh, organizing different kind of events or, or, or whatever that they are doing, but with uh, 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 not being part of the party, it is important because we try, uh, we then tend to, you know, support each other, never, whatever happens, you know, you just have this inertia of self supporting people, but uh, also the members, and uh, then we try to, to communicate. It is challenging and it is time consuming and it is even boring sometimes, but. Uh, it's basically the question, the values that you are trying to intervene into the creation of this organization. But I tell you, uh, I understand that this other part, this big, uh, you know, old school parties that are huge and so on, they, I'm, I'm not sure that they can even go back now after years of this, after years and years of uh, one person is the, lead, the leader, he's the messiah, and he's going to save us all from the other other parties that we don't like we try not to do this and if i may uh say we try to use this feminist uh, approach on, on stuff and to, you know to loosen up a little bit not not to be like others thank you very much Shaisa, you have a yeah i agree with what you said about me and as you were talking i wrote down the cult of leader and circled it um so yeah i agree with you i think um you know one of the biggest things that I've learned from the last two weeks since I resigned, and it's been very humbling for me and actually a bit mind blowing as well, is the number of people who reached out to me and they, they seem to be a bit shocked and surprised that you as a person can have agency 
and you can make a decision for yourself. You don't have to just be listening to what people are telling you and going along with it. You can actually say, no, this is a red line for me. And so I have to stop. Um, and I think this is something that in the, is not, it's not something that most people are comfortable with or feel that they can actually uh, enact. They don't feel like they can enact their agency. So I think this is about uh, critical thinking and independent thinking. And so much of our organised politics in the UK, at least, is not about independent thinking or critical thinking. It really does feel at times like you've joined a cult and you all have to go in the same direction. And if you don't, all don't go in the same direction, then you're the bad person. Equally, there's a lot of very bad behaviours I've witnessed, OK, in the last six years of formally being elected as a politician. Uh, I remember when I was first described as a politician, I felt a bit physically unwell. I was like, ew. Who's that? And I had to kind of get over myself, right? I really remember when someone called me that and I was like, are you talking about me? I don't like being called a politician. I got over myself in relation to that. But I think the challenge here is about this whole thing about the cult of leader uh, and this whole thing about um, being able to disagree in a, in a constructive way that is not personalized, that is not vicious, that is not vile. Uh, and one of the problems that we have in the UK is we've got a government that is imploding and we have a, a party in the opposition that has no vision and where everyone is supposed to just keep going along the same track. So for me, this is something that I think politics needs to fix. We need to find ways of creating spaces where we can, dis if we're not disagreeing, there's a problem, right? We how can everybody be agreeing with each other but it's about how you disagree or how you agree um and i'll just wrap up on my point by saying the other thing that some of us are campaigning for in this country is proportional representation first past the post doesn't work and one of the reasons why people are being switched off by politics is because the system itself it is it's there to serve a few people. So we have 625 parliamentarians in this country. No one can tell me that they're the best people in the whole country. It's a myth, right? Just because you went to overwhelmingly to Eton or you went to Oxford or Cambridge and you've been told this from a young age doesn't mean it's true, okay? So I think part of the challenge also is that um, I, I'm not saying that lived experience is the only experience because I think there's a danger in believing that to be the case, because actually lived experience often is about trauma and it's about things people are carrying that they have never had the ability or the support to deal with. However, if you've got a homogenized group of people who are running countries that are becoming more complicated and more and more diverse, particularly here in the UK, then how are you ever going to be able to connect with those people? Um, so these are some of the challenges that I think we need to, um, start digging into and also um, valuing those people who are working outside of political space because often people working outside of political space have more space and room to do politics that's where real politics is being done I'm talking about the food banks I'm talking about the places where people are being supported in the day-to-day -day essential services that is frontline politics much more than walking into a council chamber and reading out you know a 10-minute speech about something which overwhelmingly isn't really going to shift anyone's life Thank you very much to, to both of you. And uh, um, uh, it did make me laugh when you, you made a parallel, Shaista, with the political party being a cult uh, sometimes and uh, expecting all its members to just follow uh, without uh, ever questioning or uh, challenging uh, the status quo that might be existing into those political parties. Um, and I guess this is not something that maybe you've experienced yet, Radomir, in the Green Party because the party is much more new. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that this is something that you want to to avoid seeing also uh, spiraling into the Belgrade's uh, Green Party uh, in the in the future. And in relation to that, I'll I'll take on a, a question uh, that I think is well related. So some, sorry that I'm not going into chronolo chronological order of the questions, but I think this is tightly linked. Uh, we have uh, someone asking, what do you think is the role of NGOs and activism when it comes to changing the status quo in the present? Uh, so indeed, uh, you were also mentioning Radomir of staying connected with activists, with civil society organizations. So how do you think that connecting with NGOs and activism is also uh, the, the key into ensuring that you don't stay in, in the status quo once you've uh, you've gone into politics? Maybe should I say? Well, uh, I would say that uh, 
uh, and thank you for this question. I think it's a very important one, but I think that uh, both NGOs and uh, also this, uh, there are a lot of people that are not part of the NGOs, but activists as, as individuals and so on. And I think that the, the key, crucial thing that what they are doing, that we are trying to do, but in different uh, ways is to connecting people. It's to connecting people about important cause, about important things that are in their local community or on the broader, as uh, European alternatives do in this trans-European uh, level. But still, I think that what uh, this uh, present uh, capitalism that we are living is, 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 is doing uh, best is destroying these communities and connections between people. And if you don't have these connections, then you are alone. And if you are alone, there is nothing you can do. I really think that you cannot do much if you are uh, alone. Of course, not as an individual. Of course, you can develop yourself. And, but but in, if we are talking about societies, we all need these coalition connections, uh, getting together and changing something. So I, I look at these NGOs and, uh, and activists as sort of a, uh, these islands of resistance to the status quo that is happening now. And then we try to connect these, uh, these islands. But there is this trap also, and I'm uh, uh, me coming from some new organization, we always see these traps in others, so I hope that we will never become one of them, is because political parties tend to in the activists when they are seeing the views of like or ideas or organs. I think that is wrong, because someone has to be on the other side, to be the, this corrective factor also on the great political parties, as I think mine is. Still, of course, you can be, make many mistakes. And, and I also told you, uh, uh, responding to the um, question before, for example, that is a way not of the out, uh, out of the connection with the people. So for me, all that we are doing actually is creating networks and connecting people so we can make the uh, social change. Mm. Thanks, Radimir. Um, so my thoughts on this are, someone who's been in the NGO sector for a num long time as well. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in the UK, the NGO sector is under attack. To be fair, most of our democratic spaces are under attack by the government. Um, NGOs have been accused of being overly political and being lobbyists. And specifically, these attacks have come around the um, protection of migrants and refugees. Um, any organisation that has actively really been speaking about this has come under attack by the British government. Uh, most recently, we had this horrific situation where the RNI, which is an organisation that launches um, lifeboats into the channel to rescue people who are drowning, came under attack by the government. I mean, staggering, right? And what the response was that the British public raised £1 million for this organisation in response to these attacks. So the NGOs now are re and civil societies operating in deeply polarized and deeply politicized space, which means that their, um, their sort of attempts to advocate for the things that we care about are becoming more challenging and more difficult. Um, and something that should be as straightforward as if someone's drowning in the sea, we should expect the lifeboat to go and collect them and hopefully you know save them in time has become a politicized issue right um having said that under the blair and brown governments uh our ngo sector and at the time i was working for the ngo sector became almost like a, a fifth arm of the government which is also very problematic because the whole point of an ngo is supposed to be independent and there wasn't enough independence there was too much um i would say I would, I would say as much as saying they were embedded, they, they were really embedded with each other. And that to me is not acceptable either. There has to be a firewall between any government, be it a left-wing or a right-wing government and civil society and NGO space. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why a lot of NGOs be, have become so compromised in relation to their lack of, uh, their inability to speak clearly and say things so uh, and advocate for things, uh, not just because of the fact that they're politically under attack, but because they have been too close to governments in the past and it's, it's not been good for them. Um, for me, I think one of the uh, most beautiful examples I can give you of civil society 
activism in the UK is post-COVID. I mean, we're not post-COVID. COVID is still here, as we know. But we had a movement called uh, Mutual Aid that was set up. Uh, I don't know if it was set up across the continent, but it was definitely set up here in the UK. It was based on um, uh, an intersectional movement, primarily, I think I'm right in saying, from the queer community, which was focused on mutual aid. It says what it's it's going to do, right? It's about um, dissolving the hierarchy, dissolving the power structures, dissolving that whole thing about, hello, we've come to save you, we're going to impose things on you. It was about co-creating a um, uh, space where when people need something, others come along and make sure they get something, i.e. socialism. Who would know? Um, so I think that really is the way forward. And, you know, these types of uh, projects and uh, systems are really, really valuable and really important. And I think in the UK, at least, we are really at risk of all these incredible people doing phenomenal work that the state should be doing. You know, the NGO, the, the civil society space has become, it's become the de facto safety net for people. This cannot be acceptable that, you know, the welfare state has disappeared and been dismantled brick by brick over 13 years of Tory rule. It's just not on. Um, so I think there's some challenges there as well. We can't allow uh, the volunteers of, of the country to become the official safety net for people because that's what the government should be doing as well. Um, so I think there's challenges there. But I do think that we're potentially moving into a new space um, which could become, uh, you know, new models of working, new ways of thinking um, that could potentially lead to creating a more equitable NGO sector, uh, one that isn't about really placing itself in the middle of everything and one that is more about being thoughtful and reflective and dealing with the legacy of why it was there in the first place. Thank you very much. Um, so we had uh, the first question before was from Spain. We are now moving to Greece uh, with a, a question from Sofia Magopoulou from the organization Prozvazi, which we work with very closely also uh, at European Alternatives. Uh, and Sofia is uh, asking you both uh, about the ideals of an activist uh, and to the pragmatic reality of politics all often have a huge gap in between those two things, between the ideals and the pragmatic reality, and which means that in the end there needs to be compromises. Uh, this in many cases means that the people involved uh, deal with disappointment. So then Sofia is wondering first, how do you deal with this in terms of, uh, in a way, HR management and keeping the spirits up uh, with yourself and with the people around you who are also supporting you and who you work with? Uh, and second question is, what is your personal experience with this uh, compulsory form of compromising? And maybe Shaifa, you want to go first and then Radomir, the, your glass up. Thanks, Sophia. Thanks, Sophia, as well. Really excellent question. So uh, when I was reading your question, I made a few notes. Um, and the words that I've written here is outsider and insider. So I have spent my lifetime being an outsider who ends up in the inside. Uh, that doesn't happen by accident. I've obviously maneuvered myself on the inside. Um, and I've always been consciously aware that I want to stay as an outsider, which isn't always possible and is very challenging. OK, so I have really, really consciously worked to stay grounded and rooted in the reasons why I'm in these spaces. And this is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. And it also means that I'm an, I'm an awkward and difficult person, okay? I'm very happy to be an awkward and difficult person, um, but I'm just saying. So I think for me, this is the strategy that I've adopted. And I also, um, because the whole point of having strategies is to adapt the strategy and to learn from things and people and the mistakes you make and so I'm also understanding that this strategy of me being the outsider who's the insider has also at times meant that I've had a big wall up okay um, and I have not always been aware of the impact that I'm having uh, positive and negative because I'm busy with a wall trying to protect myself and trying to shield myself from all sorts of things that I don't really want to be involved in so as I get older and as I understand the incredible power of being an outsider insider, I have been trying to dismantle these walls and to find ways of having more constructive dialogues 
Um, and also red lines, okay? So I've explained to you all here that my red line was this uh, situation that we're currently in the UK with the opposition party, the Labour Party in its shameful stance on the situation in Gaza. That for me was a red line. And also, I'm. we, we can have lots of red lines, okay? We have to be able to shift our red lines and we have to know which red line is in dark in a faint red and which red line is you know you can't see so much which which red line is thick which one is thin and we have to be able to know how we can work around them so my point here is pragmatism is really essential um and my personal experiences with this is if you are a person who wants to be in these spaces we have to understand compromise is really important but not compromising yourself to the point where you sh you don't stand for anything and Malcolm X told us, if you don't stand for something, you'll, you'll fall for anything. Simple as that. And I think the challenge that we have at the moment is if you ask lots of people in, in politics officially, what do you believe in? They honestly can't tell you. They can make some generic statement, but beyond that, they can't say anything. And I think the reason for that is not because they're terrible people, just to be clear, but it's because there's not enough education around how to build solidarity and how to work with people and how to you know all those things that you should be able to do so my personal experience has been that nuance is really important to me and i get criticized by lots of different people because i believe you multiple truths can be truthful at the same time and it may be that i don't like the multiple truths being truthful at the same time at the same time, I know they're truthful. So I have to hold on to that and I have to find a way to work through it and to be pragmatic and to build bridges. Burning bridges is not a good move. So even though I've left the Labour Party, I left on principle. I, I've, I've written, a, uh, even if I don't say so myself, a very good, frank, clear article. Um, and I've done clear media work, which has not been about me. It's been about the humanitarian and human rights crisis that we're in and why we need to see better from a future prime minister of this country. I am not standing there uh, shouting my mouth off, you know, um, uh, being saying vicious things about anybody personally. I am talking about the issue. And for me, that's how I um, navigate these spaces as an activist. I focus on the issue and I try and build as much dialogue as possible. And for me, final point here, Philia, for me, I'm really aware of this, right? If there's someone who is really problematic for me, I'm not talking about organised fascists or transphobes or homophobes, people with vile they're not views as bigotry. I'm talking about people I don't agree with politically who don't fall into these camps. I will make an extra effort to listen to them because I'm aware that m consciously I don't want to listen to them and I want to keep them over there and I want to shut them down. So what I will do is I will make extra effort to listen to them and to try and uh, figure out where they're coming from and why. And I will try and negotiate some space with them where we can find at least one grain of something which we can work with and overwhelmingly that's why I've been able to do a lot of very good work in my city which I'm very proud of alongside incredible people including of course the public and the residents of the city. Thank you very much Shasta. Uh, maybe Rabami if you want to to add a few words. Maybe just few, because uh, Shaista really uh, answered nicely, and I, I agree with a lot of what you said, and especially I like the part where you said outsiders and inside, outside, inside part, and they, um, well, I mean, I, it doesn't have to be so, as you also said, with, with this uh, different kind of truths and, and everything, it doesn't have to be so clear, this division, and uh, it often is not clear, the ideals and the pragmatic reality, and I am one of the people that are sometimes um, sort of accused of being idealistic or naive in the, using the arguments and so, but I really think that it should be uh, some uh, sometimes demasked into this uh, naiveness that we just want to live better or we just want to live more equal or nobody is, uh, everyone is equal to, uh, every person is equal to other uh, person. And uh, sometimes when you say it like that, it... it, it uh, it's not naive, it's the idea, it's the values, it's what you want to, you know, what you want to achieve. Okay, maybe we cannot do it. Uh, history tells us that we cannot uh, achieve it so easily, of course, but uh, should we then stop uh, pursuing these ideals? And I was also, I like this question also, and I, I was trying to answer it in the uh, written because you can answer it here. And uh, I was also thinking about this, that uh, uh, how, what we try to do, I always 
try to say something from our, my experience. And uh, what we try to do is maybe to, uh, to have some clear steps in achieving these goals and then see after some time, are we closer or not? And I'm speaking this in the terms of the organization, the organization wise, of course, that, this, uh, that uh, you need to have these measurements and to see what did you do or, or because then you have to continue working if you, if you, if you don't. I hope this uh, brings any sense to you. Sorry if I, I was a bit unclear. It makes complete sense. And the only th other thing I was going to say is I think sometimes as activists, we really forget this. Our role is to do the best we can and hand the baton on. And part of the challenge, um, again, I, I'm, I'm specifically focusing on the UK because it's the most um, experience I have in terms of my political journey, right? Uh, is the if you look at the left, dear God, is all I'm going to say. Okay, um, uh, it's a very muddled place, right? And often it's hard to work out what the left. Um, and one of the muddling aspects for me is a lack of diversity there, and there's this obsession with clinging onto a microphone and keeping hold of it, so you only you can speak. And it's like guys, and it is mostly guys, by the way, um, it is like, hello, uh, we, we have crisis upon crisis upon crisis. Um, we cannot have the same people talking about everything all day long uh, for 50, 60 years, because surely um, 50, 60 years on, if things have not moved on in the way that they need to, we need to ask ourselves what we do with this movement, what we do with the movement building. Um, and this is why currently uh, I see very incredible work being done by the younger generation who really understand intersectionality. We are not interested in green, yellow, red, blue in terms of colours for the political parties. They're interested in the issues and they're interested in getting to work uh, from an intersectional lens. And I find this really powerful and humbling. Um, and I think this is where the future is. Thank you very much. I think what, what I hear in both of, of your testimonies is that you, you have to be a bit uh, hopeful uh, to be doing that kind of work anyway at some point. Uh, and I, I can confirm as a youth activist, um, yes, we might have sometimes our uh, a bit uh, like sad moments and uh, feeling hope at times, and that's normal. But deep down, we do believe that change is possible. Otherwise, we wouldn't keep on going. Uh, and that's what, of course, keeps us going. Um, there, there's a genuine belief uh, that we can we can improve uh, as a group uh, and as a society. Uh, and in relation to what you were just mentioning, Shaista, um, I would like to read the, the comment question uh, from Stefan Ogbona, um, who is saying, I have learned through activism to work with people who share different views with me to find a middle ground to resolve our diverse opinions. Is resigning from an elected post the best practice when we engage people who don't think or view the world like us. I believe that sitting at the table help us a minority group to advocate for our rights. That's Please, uh, can I, can I, because it is about you, <laughs> uh, can I offer a, a, an opinion? A bit, I mean, you said it so, so well, there are these uh, red lines, some are thick, some are, some are not, and then uh, um, yes, it is better to be on the table because uh, around the table because uh, you need to be able to speak for yourself or for the group that you are spe speaking for. But sometimes, sometimes you can't. There's, it, it, it's, it's just something that you cannot contribute anymore because the things are, are gone terribly wrong. And it should be said because then you end up into actually reproducing the situation and you just uh, continue the status quo because we, we, we didn't do anything on something that is really important for me, and then I would like not, not to participate in, into this. I mean, it is a fine uh, balancing what, what is uh, uh, the question that gets you out of the table, but in this uh, way, Shaista, I would li just like to applaud you in, in, in a little bit. Like, from here. Thank you, Radomir, and thank you, Stefan, for your question, which is really important. And believe you and me, I did wrestle with all these things uh, before I handed my resignation in. Now, this notion of sitting at the table is really interesting. If we are given access to sit around the table and then we're told to be quiet and uh, we're told you can't talk about this, you can't talk about that, you can't do this, you can't do that, what's the point of being at the table? I don't want to be at the table if I'm gagged, okay? I want to be at the table. I want to take my rightful seat at the table to represent. 
uh, to speak clearly about the issues um, that I'm there to speak about as a representative of a wide constituency of people. So my, and I know not specifically just focusing on me and my resignation, however you've used that as an example, this didn't come easily to me and it wasn't that hard, I'll be honest with you. Um, I've spent more than 20 years being an international aid worker. I've spent all that time advocating for humanitarian access um, and, you know, for me not to advocate it in the Labour Party is inconceivable. Um, I think part of the challenge often is when people like me show up, minoritised people, we are expected to be at that table at all costs. And often just being at the table is enough. Uh, oh, look, there's someone who looks like her at the table. Well, I'm not here to be a token. I'm not here to uh, just be at the table. I'm here to, um, you know, evoke everyone's humanity to ask for accountability when people's humanity is being denied and to challenge the status quo. Um, so this was not an easy decision for me and it wasn't a difficult one either. Um, uh, I'll just sort of, again, say to you very clearly that um, when I did resign along with my colleague, some of the most humbling uh, responses were from older Pakistani men. So men who came to this country, my dad's generation, uh, I wrote about it in this Guardian piece I mentioned to you at the end of the piece. I say that, you know, these two gentlemen came to me. They were invited to the UK in the 1940s and 50s after the war to rebuild this country. They said to me, by standing up for the Palestinians, you're standing up for us. OK, and I will never forget that. I will never forget that for a large swathe of the population of this country, they don't feel anyone's ever stood up for them. And I think that is really humbling and it speaks to this outsider insider um you know strategy that i talked to you about um by me grounding myself uh, as an outsider who is an insider i did never suspended my critical thinking i never suspended the reasons why i'm there now i'm not saying everyone should leave absolutely not okay what i am very proud of is that 20 of us resigned collectively that's no, sorry in, in, individually we've created a collective and despite the attempts for the British media and others to say this is a Muslim Jewish issue, we are from all walks of life, okay? And we're very proud of that. Um, and we now have, we have created a wave that was needed for uh, those in power to come to their senses. Now, am I telling you they're gonna come to their senses because I resigned? Of course, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is I've passed the baton on now, right? And I feel um, very uh, peaceful and content in doing that because what we cannot allow is for ourselves to be compromised when we are invited to the table. There's plenty of tables I've been invited to in my life that I've refused to go to because I don't want to be instrumentalized, okay? I'm not gonna show up to every table because I've been invited because that, that's that's of no political um, use to me and what I believe in as an activist and as a politician. Thank you very much, uh, Shaisa. Uh, I, I want now to to uh, read you a question that perhaps is slightly more for Radomir, and then we have a question that is slightly more for Shaisa. So you'll have uh, each of you uh, an opportunity. Um, so the question is from someone anonymous. Uh, you are both very much thanked for your wonderful presentations. Um, so uh, the question is uh, about the use of public space for the cultural consciousness, uh, which is also needed in non-capital cities. Um, so the question is, have you been able to work on developing cultural spaces in other regions and spaces outside of Belgrade uh, and developing such spaces in uh, different parts of the country, uh, depending on your cultural political agenda yourself and perhaps also with the with the greens yes this this is also a political question how do how are you using public uh, spaces or uh, spaces that are in uh, the, uh, that are owned by the by the state or the already other level of the government uh, we have been uh, working with different countries also especially with croatia also with montenegro also but this this is the region of the Balkans uh, that we are being connected into the same political and uh, context because we are all part of the former Yugoslavia and uh, if you are if you are a part of the similar context that it would be much easier to work with but this is something where we started but we were also working with other uh, other European countries uh, Sweden 
Uh, we worked with Italy, with Spain, with uh, Germany. Um, let's stop there. I think a lot of countries. But the thing is that uh, there's a little bit specific uh, context in Serbia because it is a sort of a captured state hybrid regime situation now in which the government has the complete control on all the political life and it is also on the sort of on the brink of something even worse i wouldn't say the old school dictatorship like we had before but still something that is being completely controlled by the by the government so if you are working in uh, let's say britain or or anywhere else in the western europe there are these mechanisms that you can take uh, for example you can go on court and then win of course it's not uh, everything is not great there also but in serbia it's a uh, situation is really terrible so you always need to work in this context in which uh, you are a uh, uh, sort of a victim of the of the of the system well i don't know if this makes any sense to you speaking about the about the public spaces but uh, we tried to learn from other uh, about these usages and there is also one really important thing that is i will, i'm starting with the negative but there is something really positive coming from the old yugoslavia it's this idea of uh, uh, of uh, how would i say it, the public ownership on, on different kind of things or, or, or joint ownership or joint uh, uh, development or ruling on other uh, uh, of uh, these kind of institutions and this uh, idea of self governance that is being uh, uh, that is something really important that we had for for decades, and that is the uh, heritage that we can also use if we are speaking about the, the some future that we want to live in, and that is why I always like to say that it is us that we want the socialism, that we want these kind of practices that are actually putting the needs of the people and the communities in the first place. So it doesn't matter if you're speaking about the public spaces or the usage uh, for the culture, or if you're speaking about the um, people that are on the streets and uh, or, or or someone all elder, elderly or uh, whoever, whatever part of the society you're speaking with, you always need to think about how are they being underrepresented? Are they having needs that haven't been fulfilled? Are there public goods or, or resources or services they can acquire in order to have a more fulfilled life? And that is something that is like, I mean, that's 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 why I'm, I am a politician because I want these things. That's that's my idea. That is behind what I'm doing. Yeah, thanks. Do you want me to come in, Fidia? Yeah. Okay, so Radimir, thanks for that again. Um, so like you, you know, uh, the issue of um, who owns public space, who can access it is really, really important and the cultural space as well. So uh, here in this country that I'm in, uh, lots of things have been stagnant, including um, social mobility, um, you know, the government keeps talking about leveling up there's no there's no such thing going on um so cultural space increasingly is the space which is being used um to shift the narrative so for example football quick example right so uh, two years ago myself and two other british muslim women who wear the headscarf the hijab we we, we organized ourselves calling ourselves the three hijabis uh, after the men's euro final in italy um we had uh, a disgraceful situation where three young black england players were subjected to grotesque levels of racist abuse when they missed penalties that was the excuse that was given and the whole world's eyes were on Wembley Stadium where hooliganism and other things were going on. So the morning after the final, we launched a petition calling on the government that was at the time led by the well-known anti-racist politician Boris Johnson, who referred to women who look like me as head uh, letterboxes and um, bank robbers because of our uh, covering. Um, so we launched a petition calling on the Boris Johnson government, the Football Association, and tech companies to ban races from football for life. Within the space of 48 hours, we secured more than a million signatures. We went viral. We were all over the world in the news coverage. Um, and we ended up having lots of dialogue, direct dialogue with the Football Association. We had Boris Johnson referring to our petition in Parliament. Um, and we have we have continued to work on this. Now, the reason why we stood up and did this, because obviously we thought it was disgraceful that the players were black players were subjected to this but prior to this they'd taken the knee and they'd been vilified by the british government for taking the knee so we understood that this cultural space 
is and cultural space football is public space as well we understood that there's something very unique going on in this space where this national conversation is taking place and um the national conversation has been hijacked by racists uh, not just those in government, but also those who are going around spewing racism online. So we need to shift this and we need to do it by standing up in solidarity with uh, the Black England players and the entire England team. So from that petition, a national conversation started, um, which is going on to this day. And um, what we've managed to do, uh, not just us as the three individual women, but the one million people, we now have 1.2 million supporters, okay? Phenomenal, right? So what we managed to do is to keep our work going through that. Um, and we've also successfully campaigned alongside two other groups to um, get the Premier League to implement um, sexual consent training across all English uh, football clubs. And as we know, uh, football in the UK the Premier League is the widest watched football league in the world. Apologies to those from Italy, it still is the Premier League. Um, and we also know that football in this country has been captured by the Saudi, Arab Saudi Arabian state with the most horrific uh, human rights records and various other horrific things going on. And increasingly, football in this country is becoming the battleground because states like the Saudis understand that it is through uh, capturing cultural space uh, which is public space, that they can soften their image and they can gain more power. So uh, I purposefully use this example here because if I was a French Muslim woman and the two sisters I work with, with were also French, because we choose to wear a headscarf, we would never, ever would have been able to A, launch this campaign, B, get 1.2 million signatures, uh, uh, you know, C, uh, access football, uh, go and help speak to those stakeholders and also go to parliament and give evidence at a parliamentary inquiry. Um, and this is why we have to understand that all of these thing, things intersect, right? So racism, bigotry, Islamophobia, uh, you know, populism in Europe and the direction the continent's going in and all the things we've been talking with all intersect. And what they do is they put more and more barriers and put more risk to people who look like me uh, or indeed look like any one of us from actually accessing public space and cultural space and doing our activism in a way that is joined up and intersectional. Um, but I feel very hopeful. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky that I'm a natural born optimist, but I do feel hopeful. I feel that this level of shift happens when the status quo is crumbling. And I will say the final point here is we have to remember as activists, our job is not to solve everything. Our job is to play our role, to play actively. I mean, obviously the clue, clue is in the title, activist. Be active, do what you can do, work with as many people as possible and pass the baton on and learn how to do things in different ways as well. Thank you very much, Shaita. Um I, I want to uh, unfortunately tell you that we don't have that much time left uh, now, so I, I will ask you to to be slightly shorter in your responses, just so that we can go through the the last very few questions, and that everyone can uh, be uh, lucky to get an answer from you both. Um, but uh, thank you so much, also for for m despite everything that is going on, also keeping the hope in your in your message and keeping the hope in like the way that you describe your respective paths as activists, and I, I very much um, relate to, to it as well. Um, so we have a question uh, that's maybe more for, for you, Shaista, uh, which is about uh, the journalism sector. Um, so you mentioned that there are not many journalists who come from uh, working class families. Um, do you believe that the media does not represent the narrative of working class families well? Uh, I'm sure that could be a very long response. Um, it would be a very short response, Sophia. No, there you go. No, it doesn't. And um, to be fair, uh, there's lots of brilliant journalists out there who have been criticised by belligerent, you know, states and all the rest of it and being killed as we speak. Journalists are being attacked in Ukraine, in Russia, in Palestine and elsewhere around the world. So this is not uh, me having a pop at journalists. But no, we need to see more diversity in our newsrooms. We need to see uh, those stories being told from angles that are actually reflective of people's realities. So there you go. There's my short answer. Thank you very much. And, and I will add that indeed, like 
we can see very clearly that the reference to uh, deaths happening in the ongoing conflict uh, cover way more the deaths happening on the Israeli side and way less on the Palestinian side, despite the number of deaths being actually the reversed uh, in proportions. Um, thank you very much. We have uh, another question from Sofia Magopoulou, uh, which is a more generic question regarding uh, elections and representation. So it seems that in most cases, the electoral systems have failed to capture qualitative representation of um, populations and societies. And both uh, Radomir and Shasta, Shasta, sorry, have experienced uh, um, in mobilizing underrepresented social groups and communities. Um, or underrepresented uh, yeah, communities, huh. as is the usual uh, used term now in, in civil society. Um, so what are, according to you, the best practices uh, to reach out and to mobilize those groups, those vulnerable groups, underrepresented groups and communities? How do you reach out to them and how do you ensure that they can be involved in a meaningful way and not just as tokens um, also, of course? Well, if uh, we are... Uh... We want to be short, but I would say that the crucial thing is understanding the needs first, and then involving those people that are that the, whose needs we are understanding to be the ones speaking for themselves, and providing them with the support and uh, what they need to be present in the in the forum in which the decisions are being made, and that's what we've been trying to do. It's not always easy, but the thing about being easy. Is it, it's much easier not to represent them, not to involve them, of course. But sometimes it's easy as providing the ramp for the people that are in the wheelchairs, because otherwise they cannot participate. Or providing the daycare for the children, if you want mothers to be present. present. Sometimes it's the basic that needs to be done in, uh, in, in just to start to involve. Uh, sorry for saying this kind of people. I, I, I don't have better, better words in English. But the thing is that you need to to, if that's your values, if that's what you want to do, if that's your organization, then you have to provide these basic things first and then to get these people to be part of the of the organization. Yeah, <coughs> thanks, uh, Radimir, for really breaking it down. Of, it's the structures, it's the barriers, isn't it, that's preventing people, which are very, you know, often people think of like really big ideas and they don't think about the basic practical things. I'm going to hold an event here. Well, how are people going to get there? They can't afford to get on the bus. They can't afford to get a taxi. They don't drive. How are you going to get them there? People sort of forget about those things. Um, I think uh, really, for me, I think there needs to be more humility from political groups and politicians. So often when we are encouraged to go into communities, there's a very extractive relationship where we're going there to tell them, well, you know, you can vote for me because I'm so excellent at this or that or the other. Um, and an attempt to get them to organize in the way that we inverted commas want, rather than seeing what actually they're doing and the value that they bring to their communities and the 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 fact that they are the front line, as I said earlier on in the examples I gave you. So I think this is about showing uh, more humility and understanding uh, that are, most politics in our communities are done informally um, and, and there's more politics there than there is in formalised politics. So I, I think it's important for us to understand why people are switching off from the ballot box, why they don't want to go there, what is preventing them. And, you know, it might it, it pains me to say this, but it may take another generation to really galvanise them, but they need to see better representation and the system is against them currently unless we get proportional representation. Uh, people are not going to stand up and uh, want to get elected because, as I said, the odds are stacked against them. So the system, there has to be more work to shift this system first and foremost. Thank you very much. Uh, just let me add something. I mean, uh, me telling you this answer is not that we don't have exactly, I mean, we don't have problems with the providing the uh, spaces that is needed. I, I would like to say, because we have uh, we have these groups, uh, in our organization, there are a group for the people that uh, disabilities, women group, uh, elderly group, youth group, and so on. But we, in one moment, we couldn't maintain the functionality of the disabilities group. Then now we have it again, but there is always this struggle. There's a reason why these people are being out of the, of the decision making. And also, <clears throat> when you come to Belgrade, it's so... Uh, it's uh, so striking to see that there are not more, there are many people in public space with disabilities, but it's not because we don't have them, because we, they can't move around. So it's it, one of the 
things are for pe- for uh, younger people when they travel to Berlin or, or or Paris and so they see these people with uh, disabilities and they're like a, a bit shocked like there's so many of them because it's better I mean it's not the it's not perfect of course you know it we know it but the thing is it's better yes the same applies to for instance the queer community because LGBTQI yeah, 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 yeah. people also uh, protect themselves from being uh, visible in the public space as uh, a matter of just of protection and so therefore it is perceived as the the, the group doesn't exist um, but it's of course not the case yeah Thank you very much. Um, so the, the question we have from Maya Geneva is uh, very similar to a question we had before. So I'll I'll skip it and I'll, I'll go to, to a question uh, from Andrelo uh, from Spain. Um, I will sum it up because it's a bit complex to go through, through it. But basically um, they're wondering about uh, cosmetic politics and cosmetic laws, uh, laws that are being passed because we know that they're gonna be popular in the public opinion, such as raising the minimum wage, very fine, very good, but the whole rest of the package that was meant to go with it disappears, basically. Uh, and so politicians and political parties in place tend to focus on those specific laws that they know will be popular um, instead of also passing others. Uh, and so the question is, how do we avoid that cult effect that you were mentioning before, uh, Shaista, and um, how do we make sure that we don't fall in the trap of uh, plastic politics? So I think this is a really good question. Sorry, who was it from, Afrile? From uh, Andrelo. Andrelo, thank you very much for that. So look, I think we can't be bogged into doom and gloom, okay? There's a lot of hor- horrific things going on, a lot of credible things going on in the activism spaces as well. So we need to get the laws passed to create change. And we also need the insiders to do their job and we need the outsiders to do their job, right? So um, that's basically how we have to work. We have to work with more more diverse range of people. Uh, we have to understand that if one group's uh, interests are not being represented, so Radame, you rightly so talked about people with disabilities, if they're missing, uh, if the justice is missing from them, then it's going to be missing for me. It's going to be missing from your your uh, group, Ophelia. You know, we have to have a more intersectional lens in how we approach these things. And I think one of the challenges we face, and we face multiple, where the rich are becoming richer and everyone else is struggling to survive, the mentality becomes a siege mentality. And we have to, we start believing that actually there's some crumbs here and we've got to distribute these crumbs to everyone else. And it's like, no guys, we we don't need the, we need the bread and the bakery, which is over there. And we need to get that and we need to distribute it equally. But we've become so used to having the crumbs and sharing them out and fighting over who's gonna have the crumbs. And this can only change if we, um, first of all, start telling our stories more impactfully um, and making each of us understand that, you know, uh, the three people, on the two people on the screen here, you all look different to me and we all share a lot in common, right? And I believe that if I'm not standing up for any one of your human rights, then I'm not standing up for my own. And this may sound like quite, you know, right on, these these stories are not being told. They're not being told in a way that makes us understand that we all our issues are interconnected, right? So for me, this is the starting point. And we get laws to change, and then we have to keep changing them further and further and further so that they become more representative of what is actually needed in society. So nice to 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 listen to you, Shaista. I really enjoyed this. Tell the truth, I will use this time to to say thank you for these inspiring words. It's been really uh, enjoying for me to to listen. But uh, what uh, Andreva asked uh, uh, a bit uh, reminded me of situation with uh, Slobodan Milosevic, who was a person that was ruling uh, Serbia in the nineties uh, and uh, maybe you know some know some don't and, and if, uh, but the thing is that uh, many he, he got many people frustrated also in Serbia besides uh, waging few wars in uh, uh, surrounding countries and so on uh, and uh, uh, the thing is that we had these changes in two thousands and uh, there was this democratic uh, opposition that got into the power and so many people tell me these days that they say We've been struggling against Milosevic so much and we put our lives into this and we wanted the change and we thought when democracy comes, everything will be better. 
and uh, it is over. The, the struggle is over. We are we won. The, our people won. And then our people became the people that you are struggling against. And they sold out factories for a uh, uh, few euros to their own friends. And then those friends employed our children to work uh, on minimal wages, which uh, from which you cannot live for. And uh, this spiral of... Uh, you know, inequalities continue to grow even more before than before in Milosevic time, because in Milosevic time nobody had anything anyway, so it was not so unequal. You know, but the thing is that uh, my response to that is get involved, get participating. You, you should, Andrello or whoever is listening to this, you should be the one that is making the decisions and st uh, stop the the these kind of things, because otherwise there is no one who is going to help us out. Only we, the people, the persons, the normal people, individuals that are hanging out in the playground or taking kids to the to the kindergarten, whatever you're doing in your spare time, only these kind of people, normal, regular people, can help each other. And the ones, the the one get to the idea that they are being messiah or whatever they are uh, doing, us, it's us that you should tell them, no, man, you are part of the community, and uh, we should uh, we should. Uh, we should win or lose together. So that, that's my answer. Yeah, I feel I can just add one really quick point. Thank you, Vladimir, for saying that so well. Um, you know, in the UK, we have a situation where calling for peace, calling for a ceasefire has become very controversial. How can we mm -hmm. be living in a society where people who are calling for a ceasefire are now, you know, akin to an enemy of the state? It is astounding, right? That's where we're at. So this is why I agree with everything you said, Radomir. We need to understand, you know, we are, you know, apart from the 1% at the top, the rest of us are in this together. And our survival and our thriving, because we don't want to survive, we want to thrive, depends on us understanding that, you know, we cannot allow people to pick each of us off um, and to, you know, decide who gets to have dignity and who gets to flourish and live and who doesn't. It's not acceptable. And I think what we have to do is become braver, more courageous in understanding the roles that each of us can play to make sure that this shifts and this changes. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, and on that note, I think uh, we will now uh, close the, the questions chat uh, because I think we've been able, yes, to go through all the questions. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for sharing your personal perspectives uh, on what it means to be an activist for you in both your uh, different local realities in Serbia and in the UK. Uh, very far, yet so close uh, in shared struggles and uh, shared mechanisms of how to maintain a meaningful engagement also um, in local politics uh, and what it means to, to be involved into politics while still being fully connected with civil society organizations and activists and not forgetting, of course, uh, that uh, on the ground activism while also being uh, involved into political institutions that you both challenge from the inside uh, at the same time. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us. That was our second uh, public lecture. We'll have more, uh, as Victoria mentioned. Uh, we'll have two more by, before the end of the year. And we were we will meet in person uh, with the participants of the program in uh, Sofia uh, in just two weeks. Uh, so, so I'm very much looking forward to meeting some of you uh, in person in Sofia. Uh, Shaista and Radomir, if you happen to be in Sofia in two weeks, you're more than welcome to, to pop by for, for a hello. Um, otherwise, uh, then I tell you, uh, thank you very much, and uh, hopefully we, we cross paths again uh, very soon, uh, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.